to a special episode of The Vantage Point. Last week I asked you to comment on whether you would like to see a video on Switzerland, Italy, and France. Well, it just so happens that a bunch of you let me know that you wouldn't mind reminiscing with me. I'm glad that you wanted to tag along and I hope that the rest of you will join us. Now, it's no secret that I'm a Southern Appalachian, or redneck boy, who happened to get some book learning. As it did with Sergeant Alvin C. York, learning opened doors for me to further study, which eventually led to teaching in a variety of places and states, including uh, other countries like the United Kingdom and Switzerland. Along the way, I've met people from all around the world who work in an equally diverse cluster of fields. For the past nine years, I've had the distinct honor of guest lecturing at SBS, Swiss Business School in Klotten, a mostly residential area just outside of Zurich, Switzerland. If you've ever flown into or out of Zurich, you've been in Klotten. My latest assignment at SBS was in March. I delivered some brain-numbing lectures to doctoral students on how to critically evaluate research literatures. As you can see from this photo, my students are from all over the world. It's fascinating to see Christians, Muslims, and agnostics working together because all of them are already leaders in business and government. They got along great, so I have hope for the future. In a rapidly changing world with all its complexities and urban lifestyles, we need markets and businesses to make our lives sustainable and even better. While my work in leadership and human resource development were instrumental in getting an invitation to Zurich, it was my interest in historical geography that propelled Amy and I to hit the road to explore areas to the south of Zurich. On a trip to Zurich in 2014, we headed north into Germany and Austria, as well as to the east to do a grand tour of Liechtenstein. That wasn't too hard because Liechtenstein is on only 62 square miles or 162 square kilometers. It's a micro state. This time we had our sights set on northern Italy and the French Alps. I came away with a deeper appreciation for our own Swiss and French ancestry. Now, there are lots of things to see and do in Switzerland. You might find it interesting that the country has four official languages and they are spoken throughout four geographic regions. Its official languages are Swiss German, French, Italian, and Romance. German is dominant in the north and parts of the southwest and the eastern portions of the country. Italian is spoken in the southeastern third of the country, and the French tongue prevails in the southwestern part. You might not have heard of Romance, but rest assured it's a small Romance language, uh, like its larger cousins Italian and French, Sardinian and Romanian, among others. It has fewer than 70,000 speakers, though, and is principally spoken in the canton of Grissons. This cultural contrast is especially interesting because Switzerland is not a large country. Its size is rather small. It has about 8.5 million people, and they're spread throughout the country in cities like Zurich, Bern, Geneva, Lugano, and Montrose. It's incredibly expensive in Switzerland, so land and housing prices make much of the country off-limits to only those who can afford it or whose families were already on the land as farmers and dairy producers. Food prices are likewise high. High, So, there is an economic reason for many traditional farm families to stay on the farm and practice their crafts. I'm particularly enamored with Swiss dairy products. Look at the lushness of these pastures, and you can just imagine how good an Alpen milch or Alpine milk chocolate candy bar would taste. Another fantastic dairy-based dish that I have whenever I'm in Switzerland is fondue. Some people call it cheese fondue, but it also features wine and herbs. It's delicious. I hope you're not lactose intolerant, otherwise it could make you sick. As we headed south from Zurich, we found that traffic became lighter. About an hour later, the Alps came into full view. Now, we live for three years in the Rockies at 9,000 feet. Our Appalachian and Rocky Mountains are impressive, but because of the shorter distances from the bottom of our mountains to the tops, a concept that we call local relief, they're just not as impressive as the Alps. Now, I know that some of you will take issue with that comment, but landscapes are like art. Their beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I also found that the slopes in the Alps are steeper, so they change elevations rather quickly. Speaking of change, one of the first things I noticed was a change in the languages found in Swiss place names. German names in the north give way to French place names like Lausanne and Luzerne, as well as Italian Lugano in the southeast. 
There's also a good supply of alpine lakes. For those of you who like classic rock from the 1970s, a little band named Deep Purple recorded Smoke on the Water in Montreux, Switzerland. The song was inspired by a casino fire that the band witnessed. Smoke from the blazes cast a shadow over Lake Geneva, hence the name of the song. We passed through quite a few tunnels on our way through the Alps and into Italy. While Switzerland is a major center for international business activity, Italy comes across as markedly more engaged in manufacturing, shipping, and commercial agriculture. The northern part of Italy has some Alps and Alpine lakes like the gorgeous one in Como, but northern Italy is mostly part of the Po River Valley. It drains to the east in Venice. In some places it reminds me of the Mississippi Delta, but if you go off the beaten tourist path, you're not likely to find an English speaker, nor will you find people who care that you are lost or otherwise bewildered. Now, when we made it into Italy's Apennine Mountains, tourists were more prominent, and so was a lack of courteous service. Now, let me mention a couple of thoughts about food. American Italian cuisine is not common in Northern Italy. On pizza, pork is a favorite topping, as is cheese and tomato paste. Spaghetti is as good as any that I've had or tried in the United States, including those I've had in Italian neighborhoods. The spaghetti that I ate tasted a lot like Stouffer's frozen spaghetti. Now, that's not a problem for me because I love Stouffer's lasagna, meatloaf, and spaghetti. Oh, be forewarned, do not drive a car into Old Town Florence. The streets are way too narrow and crowded with foot traffic for my liking. If you get overwhelmed too easily from external stimuli, you may find it hard to locate a place to, to just settle down and be quiet for a few minutes and gather yourself. If you like standing in lines for more than 30 minutes, you'll love Florence, but you can make reservations in advance. They're expensive, so you need to be committed to your itinerary. I highly recommend visiting Florence by train. Between Florence and the Swiss border, you will find Milan, or Milano as they say, and Bologna. They're major cities that blend both modern and ancient artistic expressions in architecture and the fine arts. Traffic can be as heavy as any American city. For safety's sake, I need to tell you that if you are going to pass a slower car on the motorways in Italy, do it quickly. On more than one occasion, while passing a slower car or truck, vehicles came up on me before I knew it. Now, they're not hesitant to use their horns to invite you to change lanes. The Italian speed limit is 130 kilometers per hour or about 80 miles per hour on their motorways. You can expect traffic in the fast lane to move along at about 140 to 160 kilometers or 93 to 100 miles per hour. It's not the German Autobahn, but it's close. I've driven both and I felt safer on the German Autobahn than on the Italian motorways. Oh, I nearly forgot to tell you about the tolls. You can expect to pay for the privilege of driving on Italian motorways, and it's not cheap. It didn't take long for us to want to see the refreshing French Alps. We took a scenic route into France. For the first time on our journey, we were stopped at the border. That wasn't much of a problem for us. We were once again in snow-covered mountains and had great views from the Skoda. We were heading into the Chamonix Mont Blanc area along the Swiss, Italian, and French border area. Chamonix Valley and Mount Blanc, the highest mountain in Western Europe, are squarely in France, but it's a major ski resort area that draws an international clientele. Amy and I lived about 50 miles from the ski resort area of Breckenridge, Colorado, and have been there a dozen times. Now, don't get me wrong, the Smokies and the Rockies have their charms, but you must appreciate that Mount Blanc is over 1,600 feet higher than Pikes Peak in Colorado, and its local relief, the change in elevation up the slope, is almost twice as much as Pikes Peak. When you start to ascend Pikes Peak, you're already at 6,200 feet above sea level, so the local relief, the change in elevation up to the top, is just about 8,000 feet, 7,950 to be precise. Mount Blanc rises some 2.33 miles or 12,300 feet above the quaint village of Chamonix. You must bend your neck backwards to see the peak and its slopes from that wee village. They are impressive or imposing depending on your point of view. There are ski slopes and cable cars galore, but people watching and window shopping are just as much fun for me. I also spent more money on gifts than was necessary. <laughs> Well, my family was happy about it, though I think they haven't really said much. A lot of chocolate. 
brought a lot of chocolate back. While there are a couple of American fast food places in the village, you'll not tire of the variety of French, Swiss, and Italian dishes that are served in dozens of fine eateries. When we travel, we have a practice of trying out Indian and Chinese foods. Chaminet has both, and they were excellent. I especially love the hot and sour soup. I'd recommend at least three days to see all the sites in and around Chamonix. Our visit was much too short. From Chamonix, we headed toward Geneva and Bern, Switzerland. We arrived back in Zurich in just three and a half hours. After a decent night's sleep, we awoke and returned to Skoda to Europe Cars kiosk at the airport or Flughafen. I must give a shout out to United Airlines, folks. We had a great experience, and it looks like they are living up to the company's motto. Fly the friendly skies, fly United. Well, that's all I have for you today. Thanks for joining me on this short tour of some of the most interesting places that I've had the privilege of visiting. Until I see you again, may the good Lord smile on you and yours. Bye-bye.